Hello, everyone. Welcome back to freepilotgroundschool.ca. This is the first lesson in uh, general knowledge, airframes, engines, and systems. We're going to be talking about aviation engines. And in case you're looking at this picture here and you're like, man, that uh, really looks like an old engine. That looks like uh, something out of a uh, Volkswagen from like 1950. You'd be correct. Uh, there's actually not much separating a, a modern aircraft engine from an air-cooled uh, carbureted engine, uh, such as the uh, original Volkswagen engines that were in the uh, vans and in the uh, Beetles. So uh, let's get started. Let's start uh, discussing both the two-stroke and four-stroke cycle of an engine. We'll start off with a two-stroke cycle. Uh, a two-stroke engine is uh, considerably lighter than a four-stroke engine. It's simple, it's easy to maintain. It's the type of engine that you might find on a uh, chainsaw, for example, or in this case, I believe that's a laser. It's an ultralight, has uh, two basically large chainsaw engines on the wing uh, driving it. Uh, it does have some very important disadvantages. Uh, one is it has high fuel consumption, and the second, it has poor reliability. A typical four-stroke engine lasts about 2,000 hours before it needs to be overhauled. I believe a four-stroke engine, or sorry, a two-stroke engine lasts about 500 hours. And uh, you talk to people that do a lot, um, a lot of ultralight flying, and uh, you know, almost all of them that have been doing it for a considerable length of time have had some sort of uh, engine failure. It's typically used where reliability is not a factor, such as chainsaws and ultralight aircraft. In a two-stroke cycle, there is a power stroke every revolution. There are uh, two strokes in a two-stroke cycle. The first is the upstroke. Uh, during the upstroke, uh, fuel, the fuel oil and air mixture is drawn into the crankcase and uh, into the cylinder. The fuel is then ignited. Then there is the downstroke of the piston at which point the exhaust is pushed out and the fuel air mixture is forced into the cylinder. Let's talk about the uh, four stroke cycle. Here we uh, are at the beginning of this lesson, we already talked about aircraft engines. On the right, uh, I had mentioned earlier, oh, it looks like a Volkswagen engine. On the left, uh, you actually have, well, a Volkswagen engine. So. Uh, a lot of home builders have taken the Volkswagen engine and converted it to uh, aircraft use because it is light and reliable and uh, is pretty good fuel consumption. The advantages of the force uh, stroke uh, engine are that it's reliable and has low fuel consumption compared to the two stroke engine. The disadvantage is that it's complex, expensive and heavy. The four stroke uh, engine is the most uh, common engine found in general aviation aircraft. There is one power stroke every other revolution or two revolutions per cycle. Let's talk about these uh, four different strokes. The first stroke is intake, the intake stroke. During the intake stroke, the piston moves down and the intake valve is open. This draws in the fuel air mixture. Once the uh, piston is at the bottom, the compression stroke starts during the compression stroke. The piston moves up, compressing the fuel air mixture. Both valves are closed. Once the piston moves to the top, or I should say uh, nearly moves to the top, the power stroke begins. During the power stroke, the fuel air mixture is ignited by a spark plug. The piston moves down and both valves are still closed. The last stroke is the exhaust stroke. During the exhaust stroke, the exhaust valve is open and the piston moves up expelling the burnt gases. At that point, the four-stroke cycle begins again uh, with the piston moving down and the intake stroke. There are two methods of cooling on uh, most aircraft engines or piston engines. First is air-cooled. It's the most common type of uh, cooling on an aircraft engine. You can see on the left, it has, uh, there are fins. Those are cooling fins to increase the surface area to increase the uh, cooling efficiency of the engine. The advantage of an air-cooled engine is it's light and simple, but it does have higher fuel consumption than a liquid-cooled engine. On the right is a liquid-cooled engine on, uh, I believe it's a Diamond DA-42, if I'm correct. That's a uh, four-seater 
uh, twin engine aircraft. Uh, I believe that's the Teeler uh, liquid cooled engine. I believe it might be called the Centurion engine now, but I could be wrong. Uh, the, uh, the disadvantage to a, a, a liquid cooled engine, it's heavier than the air cooled engine, but it does have better fuel consumption. Let's talk about the Magneto. So uh, a Magneto, last time you've probably heard of a Magneto is when you were working on your lawnmower. Most lawnmowers are four stroke engines and they have a Magneto. And the aircraft engine is basically a glorified lawnmower engine. It has a carburetor, has Magnetos, nothing fancy. Very few of them have anything electronic in them. The purpose of a Magneto is to convert rotational energy from the engine and to high voltage electrical energy to power the spark plugs and then send the electrical energy to each spark plug at the correct time. The big advantage to a Magneto is that the ignition will continue to work even when the engine isn't developing electrical power, such as if you've had an alternator and a battery failure. As long as the engine's running, it generates its own power. On the left, you can see how a Magneto uh, looks like from the exterior. And then on the right side is how the uh, Magneto looks like when cut open. The rotation of the engine turns what is essentially a small alternator, a small generator inside the Magneto and that creates an AC current. A coil containing primary and secondary loops, so it's basically a transformer, increases the voltage, and that voltage is stored inside of a capacitor. There is a distributor uh, block that spins and points that direct the current from the capacitor to the spark plug at exactly the right time. There's also a feature in aircraft magnetos called the impulse coupling. The impulse coupling you can see is the black thing on the upper right corner. What the impulse coupling is, is a mechanism with a spring inside that creates a higher potential, so more spark at low RPM. And this is very important for starting. When you start the engine, obviously there's not much of rotation. And so ordinarily you would have not much uh, current, not much voltage going to the capacitor. But with the impulse coupling, it has a spring inside and it kind of clicks, you turn it, and then it just makes everything spin a lot faster uh, for a very brief period of time when you, when you need that spark during starting. Okay, this is a very important principle of the Magneto that you need to be aware of. It will, may come up on your test, may come up uh, on a flight test and uh, it may come up whenever you're operating an aircraft. The magneto is shut off by grounding the electrical signal to the ground, to the airframe, so that no current can flow to the spark plug. So here's a question for you. What happens if the ground wire breaks? Well, if the ground wire breaks, the magneto is no longer off. And if that propeller is turned, there is a possibility that a spark will be created. And if a spark is created, that engine could start or at least uh, fire and turn over a few times. It's quite a dangerous situation when this happens. Let's talk about dual ignition. Aircraft engines have two magnetos. This is done for redundancy and extra power. There are two spark plugs per cylinder. Each magneto powers one spark plug per cylinder. You have a top magneto, or sorry, a top spark plug powered one of the, by one of the magnetos and a bottom spark plug powered by another magneto. So what happens if one magneto fails? So take a look at this diagram and try to figure out what would happen if one magneto failed. So let's take out the left magneto here. Okay, that has failed. So we've lost this spark plug, we've lost this spark plug, and then we've lost the bottom spark plug here, the bottom spark plug here. However, this is still working. So we still have a spark plug, a spark on each cylinder. So what will happen is, well, we'll just have a slight reduction in engine power.
So think about how would you check the magneto function? On the runner, you will you have uh, the ignition switch is usually a key which has left and right to select the left and right magneto or both magnetos. And with power applied to the engine, you're going to select the left and right magneto only. If one of the magnetos is unserviceable or doesn't work, then the engine will fail when the bad magneto is selected because you just shut off the good magneto. Let's discuss the exhaust system. The purpose of an exhaust system is to remove the exhaust gases clear of the engine and take these exhaust gases and blow them clear of the aircraft. Most exhaust systems work off a collector system. All the cylinders feed into a collective exhaust system. In older Warbirds, you had a short stack system. So as opposed to a collector system where all the cylinders feed into a collective exhaust system, as you see on the right, on the left, the short stack system is a series of exhaust ports directly off uh, the exhaust uh, port on the engine, go to short stacks and those vent the exhaust overboard. The short stack system uh, generally has better uh, power. There's less, it's easier for the aircraft to clear the exhaust, uh, but it is considerably noisier. Let's talk about some auxiliary controls. First off, we have the mixture control. Mixture control on almost all aircraft is a red knob. The purpose of the mixture control is to control the air fuel ratio in the engine by setting the amount of fuel going into the intake airflow. This occurs in the carburetor, and the purpose of this in an aircraft is because an aircraft changes altitudes considerably, and at higher altitudes, you want to have less fuel in the engine going into the engine because you also have less air or less dense air going into the engine. So leaning the mixture sets a higher air fuel ratio, reducing fuel consumption. The other purpose for the mixture control is pulling it all the way off is called idle cutoff. And at that point, the mixture valve completely closes, uh, so stops fuel going into the engine. So you can see this picture here on the right. You can find that also a bold method. You can check out their website or their YouTube channel. And it, uh, it just adjusting the mixture would be right here and that adjusts how much fuel goes into the discharge nozzle right here. Additionally, we have a carburetor heat control. In the carburetor, you have a venturi, which you can see right here, these, okay. And in the venturi, there is a lower pressure, and because of the lower pressure, it can get colder than the ambient air. And this is important. The worst carb ice occurs at high humidity and temperatures above and below freezing. So from minus five to plus 10. The reason for this is because the air is in a liquid state entering the carburetor. And then because the temperature and pressure decrease inside the carburetor, that liquid uh, water vapor can then freeze in the carburetor and can get stuck all in here around the throttle. When it's very cold out, you won't tend to get carburetor icing because the water vapor is already in the frozen state entering the carburetor. When you have carburetor ice, the engine will run rough. When you pull the carb heat on, the engine will run even rougher. And this is because the ice is now melting and there's water going through the engine. When this occurs, it is imperative that you keep the carburetor heat on until the carburetor ice has cleared from the engine. So we can see in the middle here, here's the carburetor heat control on a Cessna. It's right beside the throttle. And then we can see right here is the exhaust, okay? There's an air intake on that exhaust. And then here is the carburetor. When we select carburetor heat on, which is actually just on the other side right here, 
what it does is it opens a valve allowing hot air from the exhaust shroud to go into the carburetor. On the right side, we can just see a cartoon of how uh, carburetor ice forms around right here, around the outside, and along this butterfly valve. Aircraft with continental engines, such as the Cessna 150 uh, and the Cessna 180 and 182, are particularly susceptible to carburetor icing due to uh, the design of the engine. A turbocharger compresses air prior to the carburetor or fuel injection system using power generated by an exhaust driven turbine. If we look at this image on the right, we see the exhaust gases vent out the exhaust here. They go through a turbine where they lose pressure and then go out the exhaust in the bottom. This turbine spins a shaft, which is connected to an air compressor. The air comes in here. I'll make this blue. The air comes in here, gets compressed by this compressor, and then goes through the throttle body here in a fuel injected engine and then high pressure air goes into the intake ports on each cylinder. The purpose of this is that at high altitudes, the air is less dense. We want to compress this air in a turbocharged engine so that uh, we get more power either at sea level or we're able to maintain power higher up at higher altitude. This is very advantageous in mountainous regions where you might fly to an airport with a high density altitude, meaning that the air is not very dense and you want to have sufficient takeoff power to take off and climb uh, power in order to clear whatever obstacles may lay in your path. High density altitude or low air density have a dramatic effect on engine performance. A higher density altitude means that the air density is lower. If the air density is lower, there's less mass of air. If we want to keep the correct fuel air mixture, less mass of air means less fuel. And if we have less fuel and less air, we have less power. So it's important to remember that high density altitude or high humidity reduce engine power and performance. Aircraft engines have operating limitations related to their maximum RPM, maximum temperatures and pressures. You can find these limitations in the uh, aircraft flight manual or POH, Pilot Operating Handbook. Usually they're in the first section under limitations. In this case, this is a, uh, an excerpt from a Cessna 150. It says the type of engine right here. And then it says, oh, here's the maximum engine speed. Here's the minimum and maximum oil pressure and the minimum and maximum propeller diameter. So many years ago, this is the kind of instrumentation that flight engineers on, oh, that looks like an eight engine aircraft would have to uh, put up with. And this is a fancy engine monitor that we get blessed with now. And here's pretty much what you will see in your Cessna 150. We have a tachometer, an RPM. Then in the bottom, we have fuel gauges and ammeter in the middle. In the bottom, cylinder head temperature gauge, oil temperature, and oil pressure gauge. Let's review uh, engines. A four-stroke engine is generally heavier, more reliable, but with lower fuel consumption. It has four stroke. Intake, compression, power, and exhaust. A two-stroke engine is lighter, but less reliable and has higher fuel consumption. There is an oil mixed in with the fuel that provides lubrication to the components in the engine. Most light aircraft engines are air-cooled because that's lighter and simpler than a liquid-cooled engine. A magneto provides a high-voltage spark at the correct timing. The magneto is disabled by grounding the magneto to the airframe, preventing a spark in the spark plug. Most aircraft have dual magnetos. Each magneto provides signal to one spark plug in each cylinder. The mixture adjusts the fuel air ratio. This is important when climbing to high altitudes. 
The carburetor heat provides heat to the carburetor when the air is humid and cool. The worst carburetor icing occurs between the temperatures of minus five and plus 10 degrees when the air is humid. Both high density altitude and high humidity reduce engine power. Let's work on some sample test questions. First off, during the power stroke, which valves are open? So remember, during the power stroke, the piston is moving down, it is developing power. You don't want to have any gases going in or out of the cylinder. That means both valves, the intake and exhaust valve, are going to be closed. Correct answer D. A magneto has failed in flight. What do you expect will happen? A, a slight reduction in engine RPM. B, a drastic reduction in engine RPM. C, the engine will fail. D, nothing. So if you recall, uh, each magneto provides uh, electrical power to one spark plug per cylinder. So if one magneto fails, we'll have one spark plug per cylinder fail, but the other spark plug will take over. The engine won't produce quite as much power, but it'll keep running. So the correct answer is going to be a slight reduction in engine RPM. B is not correct because the it's not like one magneto powers all the spark plugs for half the cylinders and you would lose half the cylinders. The engine won't fail because we have dual ignition and well, something will happen. The ground wire and the magnetos failed. What can you expect to happen? So recall the ground wire is what shuts the magneto off. So if you're flying along and the ground wire fails, nothing will happen. However, when you have to be very uh, careful if the ground wire fails, once you shut the magnetos off, the magnetos will still be live. And if somebody turns the propeller, there's a chance that the engine will fire. The ground wire on the magneto has failed. What is the major risk? So as we just talked about in the last question, major risk is that the engine could start if the propeller is moved. So we'll just work through it. The engine will not start when required. No, that's not true. The engine will start. Uh, the engine will run, but there will be insufficient power for takeoff. Nope, uh, the, the magnetos will work just perfectly fine, but the engine could start if the propeller is moved and the engine will not shut off. That one's not really correct because we use the mixture. Remember, we use the mixture uh, to idle cut off to shut off the uh, engine. You're flying on a fall day and notice a slight decrease in engine RPM. Suspecting carb ice, you apply carburetor heat. The engine RPM drops significantly and runs so rough that you are worried that the engine will stop, stop producing power. What do you do? A, leave the carbide on as the ice will eventually melt. So that is uh, sounds like the right answer. Uh, B, immediately close the carb heat. No, you don't want to do that because you it looks like you have carb ice and then what will happen is you will just end up uh, icing up the carburetor and eventually that engine will quit. Uh, close the carb heat if the situation doesn't resolve itself within two seconds. Uh, no, that's not really true. D, switch fuel tanks. Like let's say you had bad fuel. Um, no, that's not correct. We're talking about carb ice here. So correct answer. You're going to leave the carb heat on as the ice will eventually melt. Once the ice melts from the carb heat, the engine RPM will pick up again. And once it picks up, you can uh, turn the carb heat off. Why does an aircraft engine produce less power in Boulder, Colorado than in Vancouver? So you should maybe put two and two together. Uh, Vancouver's at sea level and Boulder, Colorado is much higher than sea level. It's in the mountains. So the density altitude in Boulder is typically higher than in Vancouver. So that's going to be the correct answer. It's colder and bolder than in Vancouver. And that, that's not correct. If it's if the density, uh, if the elevation is the same, colder air will actually produce more power. It's warmer in Vancouver than Boulder. Nope, uh, it's not correct. We're talking about altitude here. And the air in Vancouver is more humid than in Boulder. Yeah, that is true. It is more humid in Vancouver. But that's not why the engine produces uh, less power in Boulder. Okay, last question. What is the major advantage to turbocharging? Better fuel economy? Uh, no, that's not really uh, true. You don't have better fuel economy. You, you burn actually more fuel with turbocharging. B, more power for takeoff and climb? Yeah, you do have more power for takeoff and climb. So that's an advantage. Uh, and C, power does not decrease with altitude. So this kind of comes down to the most correct answer. And that this is the biggest advantage. 
So yes, you have more power for takeoff and climb with a turbocharger, but its biggest advantage is that you're able to maintain power all the way up to altitude. Indeed, none of the above, well, that's not correct. Okay, that concludes this lesson on aircraft engines. Thanks for joining me, and we'll see you in our next lesson.